Hello. Okay, so I have this really well rehearsed uh, presentation, wonderful images, uh, lots of jokes, but sadly that's not what I'm presenting today. Um, I'm going to try something new. Where Art Tutor once told me, if you if you're really good at something, then it's time to move on and try something else. So I'm going to try and and use the theme of the panel of the weird and wonderful to uh, <clears throat> look at my practice through a different lens. And uh, instead of using the words weird and wonderful, I'm using some other words that are German and Spanish, just to make things more woolly. Um, also. Uh, this was also an opportunity for me to respond to some of the discourse that's uh, being proposed at this uh, conference, uh, most specifically the Haunted Machines, uh, a mini conference within a conference. And, and it's kind of um, slightly tragic that actually they can't be here to hear this. We're actually in different rooms. So, uh, you know, if you, if you actually disagree with me and you believe in magic, then, you know, you can just swap to the other room. Um, so, I'm going to just, there, there's some themes that run through current practitioners' work at the moment. One is this, this idea of, like, you know, we shouldn't infantilize technology, you know, we shouldn't reduce it down to, to symbols and, and stories such as the cloud. And I've seen a lot of practitioners wave this banner, you know, like, you know, this, this, this is a parody of a lot of slides that I've seen. Uh, and so that's considered bad practice in, in, in some discourse amongst some practitioners. Uh, and now we have the, the, the this other, Discussion about technology, if, it's, if, if you compare it to magic and you think magic's a wonderful thing, you know, that's also bad practice, you know, that's, you know, um, somehow techno-utopian and, 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 you know, a false set of beliefs. But if we use technology um, and, and we, we kind of understand that actually it's not all great, it's kind of bad and it's, it's got all these demons in it, then, then suddenly the analogies are somehow useful. I think for me that was kind of... Uh, conflicting about the, the premise of haunted machines. Um, you know, the, you have, you know this, this, is, this is bad practice, uh, but this is useful in practice. I've never actually, I haven't, had, I haven't seen anyone you know, say, this is what my practice is about, but it's kind of like a proposal for a, for a new way of putting, putting things, um, uh, a new way of describing things. So I'll just kind of break down, you, you can disagree with me on many of these points, but I've just made some points Generally, why, why, do we, why do we use analogies? And I think one of the ma main reasons is uh, analogies are heuristic. You know, if, if you have, if, if you can't describe something, you, you, you kind of resort to the next best thing, you know, and it might, it's, it's a compromise, you know, there's not, it, you know, you kind of find a common language with your audience. If the audience doesn't understand data centers, then yes, you might be able to explain it in terms of the cloud or, you know, these other things. Uh, also, analogies are expressive. I mean, you know, it's poetic. It's poetic to describe something as something else that's kind of a little bit more colorful. Um, so that's good use of, I mean, some good points for analogies. Um, but then in terms of like, you know, why can we use it for, for, for describing good magic, but uh, why, why shouldn't we describe it for describing uh, technology as good, and, and, but we can use it to describe uh, technology as bad, uh, maybe it's to dispel techno-idealism. We don't, we, we don't want to be idealist about technology. We don't want to be techno-utopian or um, techno-determinist. So, we, you know, maybe, maybe that's the case. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you cancel out the ignorance. You know, if, if uh, on one hand you're, you're ignorant about, you know, what technology really is and you, you kind of indulge in these analogies, but at the same time you're showing you're aware how technology is, you know, actually possessed and has kind of, like, um, kind of is kind of darker character behind it. That maybe maybe that's okay. Then I don't know. Um, so potential problems with that. These are th this is this is the moment when I slide in in my slideshows. Like okay, I'm going to like really annoy some of my peers now. Um, but but these are kind of worst case scenarios. You know, is there is there is there a scenario that you become a bit of a hypocrite? You know, you kind of you uh, by adopting analogies where 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 engaging in the behaviors that we were condemning like a year ago, like don't compare it to a cloud. Uh, uh, are we positing a good versus evil dichotomy? You know, I think all arguments that are based on dichotomy are sort of problematic in the first place. So to say that there's, there's this simple solution here where we have good technology and bad technology and there's the angels and the demons and the white magic and black magic, for me that's, 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 a, that's a problematic dichotomy on which to base your argument. And 
a lot of this comes from this discourse of being uh, critical. And I, I kind of wonder, you know, critical has two meanings. It can be, mean criticizing, which is kind of pointing flaws at things, but it could also mean critical thinking. And sometimes there's a tendency to be actually more criticizing than critical thinking, which to me is more about uh, being objective and, and kind of seeing the bigger picture. Um, and then, okay, this, these are like really worst case scenarios. Like what if, what, you know, what if the practitioner becomes, uh, takes on the role of the alarmist, you know, the person that rings the klaxon, like, you know, oh, oh my God, look at, look at what they're doing now, or it'll be toasters the next year and all that kind of thing. Um, or in the spirit of analogies, what, what if the practitioner um, takes on the role of the witch hunter? And I think this, this image like, was just like the perfect for what I wanted to, to put across. That, you know, like one, one week we're pointing out, oh, you know, this is, this is Lenovo we've discovered. It's got malware. The week before it was Samsung. It listens to us. The week before it's Amazon uh, with a new device that's going to record us in the home. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, as, as practitioners, you know, do we want to become witch hunters? Uh, do we want this, is this what our, our role is, you know, and we have our Twitter followers, you know, the mob in the background listening to us, you know, point out all the flaws and all, all the bad things technology do, and, you know, we're, we're going to expose them. I mean, exposing them and, and kind of enlightening up society with uh, these kind of dark secrets is, has its value, but at the same time, you know, in a really worst case scenario, what if this is the kind of response that we're, we're, we're getting from, from our audience, you know? There's kind of a tendency to join in in the witch hunt. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if I want that, uh, personally, in my work. Um, so, well, I don't want to be all negative, so I, I want to actually come up with some constructive conjectures. I like the word conjectures. I discovered it recently that mathematicians, when they're talking to each other amongst their peers, they, they talk about things in terms of problems and conjectures. And conjectures are sort of ideas for solutions rather than solutions themselves. Um, so uh, one is about consolidating the real and magic and this for me is about uh, kind of in western literature you really have this kind of separation between realism and fantasy this is kind of like a post enlightenment thing um, and I grew up in South America and in South America uh, literature from like the 30s onto the 70s really kind of um, decided against this and said, you know, what about, what about the weird stuff that happens on the fence? You know, it doesn't quite fit in to the, the, uh, the, um, the category of fiction or non-fiction. Uh, th those kind of things that we can't quite... Um, uh, well, well, I'll kind of discuss it in a minute. Uh, anyway, this kind of literature movement in Spanish is called the Real Maravilloso, uh, which has kind of been translated into magical realism. Um, but in a way, I prefer the term real maravilloso because maravilloso has this like, wonderful ambiguity about whether it means wonderful or magic. Um, and it really kind of um, uses that ambiguity to, to create uh, stories where you're not quite sure if the, the author is uh, telling you an anecdote that really, really actually happened or it's, it's kind of make-believe. And um, one of the storytellers in this kind of category is Garcia Marquez who's a Colombian uh, writer. Um, and so he, like this, he's talking about his, his take on this, and he says, all I know that without doubt is that realis uh, reality doesn't end with the price of tomatoes. In uh, Rivadavia, South Ar uh, Argentina, the winds lifted an entire circus into the sky, and the next day the fishermen's nets found not fish, but the cadavers of lions, giraffes, and elephants. Um, even reading this, I'm not sure if he's making, up, uh, making it up or not. Uh, it's, you know, may, maybe it's folklore, maybe, you know, maybe actually it was just a lion escaped and drowned, and then by the time it made its way up to Colombia, it was kind of uh, it transformed. Um, so I, I have this website called Algopop, uh, it's a blog, it's a Tumblr, um, and, and it's where I kind of um, c aggregate all, all these anecdotes that I, I'm interested in, and uh, yeah, as as far as this um, pointed out, it's it's about um, uh, this, the, the kind of like uh, social entanglements with algorithms and automated systems. And my favorite part about doing Algopop is actually aggregating, uh, finding anecdotes like user experience anecdotes where people have had like some you know really strange things happening to them. Um, one is uh, Eileen Hocken. 
uh, this elderly woman who's uh, using Facebook. She's trying to speak to her granddaughter. Uh, and somehow her, her name gets transformed into grandma, to Grandmaster Flash. Uh, and, and, and this is not just... Um, this is not just a rare occurrence. This is actually a frequent occurrence. You know, I, I kind of w wonder what Grandmaster Flash's dashboard looks like when he logs into Facebook and finds that everyone's impersonating him, uh, and it's all these, this cohort of elderly women. Um, uh, here, here's another one that I like. Um, so, <laughs> so you probably can kind of reverse engineer what's happening here. Someone's you know, used, used an app to try and find out what the, the name of their business is in English, and just got something in English, and, and then thought, that must be it. And, and he's, I really want to get my hair cut here. It'd be an amazing pilgrimage. Um, <clears throat> uh, here's another story that I found. Um, so loads of people started like, really looking into this. In Google Translate, if you use the Latin to English translation, you get these really strange translations. Um, <laughs> And it doesn't make any sense, you know? And people are like really pondering, what the hell is going on here? Like even the slight variation in the nonsense Latin that you put in will give a very different output. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I was following the threads uh, in, on, on blogs and uh, security experts, internet experts, really trying to figure out what the hell's going on here. And, and all the experts were saying, okay, this is definitely, definitely a secret messaging service. Uh, and, I, and at the time, I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, if, if, if I was a spy and I heard about this terrorist plot to, uh, I don't know, attack Minneapolis involving tomatoes, then, of course, I would use nonsense Latin to, to communicate this back to HQ. And they'd, they'd, then they'd use Google Translate to, you know, put it in and find out the message that you're sending them. And I actually ended up promoting this folklore <laughs> across the internet. I actually blogged secret messages service found in Google Translate. Um, obviously, someone then explained to me, actually, the uh, uh, graphic designers, what they do when, they, um, um, before, when, when they're kind of working on a website is they use uh, Laura Mipson, you know, this, this, this block paragraph of Latin as placeholder text. So uh, Google web crawlers pick up both that website first in Latin and then in English, and then it creates um, a database of like a nonsense translation, and that's where the, the uh, error happens. Um, so another conjecture would be exploiting the Unheimliche. Uh, Unheimliche actually uh, is an essay published first, um, well, I, I'm referring to an essay published by Sigmund Freud in 1919. It's been translated to English as the uncanny, but actually he was looking for the perfect word to describe what he was trying to describe, and he went through all these different languages, and uncanny was actually a word that he dismissed. Uh, so it's kind of a shame that we've kind of adopted the translation that he kind of dismissed. Um, and it's, it's about this jarring feeling of something being both familiar and unfamiliar. Uh, and I think it's quite pertinent to a lot of our experiences on the internet, uh, especially involved in software automation. Uh, and a great author that, you know, is a total master of using the, the Enheimle is Jorge Luis Borges, an uh, Argentinian writer. And I could quite happily speak for 20 minutes about Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, but instead, well, I'll just give you a reading list. Aleph, uh, The Lottery in Babylon, excellent. Um, especially if you want to understand maybe like uh, consequen unintended consequences of what you might put online. Um, the Tower of Babel has kind of been described as being a bit like databases and Amazon. Uh, this one's great too. Uh, the God Script is great too. Uh, Partial Magic in the Cohote is actually an essay he wrote which, where he talks about his influences. And so it really kind of breaks down what he's trying to do in his literature. And he says that he wanted to, to cross over the, the, the world of the reader with the world of the book. So actually, you're kind of reading his stories and you're, 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 you're transfixed in this world he's created and then you realize Borges is actually in the story, being told about the story that he's about to write. And then the whole thing just kind of um, has, you know, there is this kind of uh, blurring of what's familiar and unfamiliar uh, to great effect. Uh, the click is not working. Okay, so uh, 
I think a really uncanny project. This is a project I like for many, many reasons. Uh, it's The Love Machine by uh, Julian Deswayev. And uh, it's a script that you can install in Facebook to automatically like everything. Um, and, and, and the effect is amazing. If, you know, it, it, it is uncanny because it, it, you realize actually this. There's something strange about someone liking absolutely everything that you post on, 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 on Facebook. And a lot of his followers aren't aware that he's running the script, so they, they, they have this kind of uh, relationship with him where they don't know if he's, if he's real, if he's not real, if this is some sort of error, if he's like some sort of creep, um, just constantly liking everything. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting project for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I think bots, uh, so bots are like these uh, autonomous software agents that you kind of uh, let loose on the internet to um, carry out certain automations. And something really uncanny about bots, I'm switching to the word uncanny because my German's not great. Um, th this, this bot, for instance, is selling, uh, generating t-shirt slogans to sell on Zazzle Marketplace. And, and it's obviously generating t-shirt slogans to a particular uh, template. And it goes through like every possible variation of wife, husband, son, daughter, and then every possible animal, every possible uh, role, uh, you know. And it just has these really, you know, just really weird combinations. Like you would never buy a T-shirt that says "My son is that cute man who loves soccer," uh, or "My wife is the hottest hamster trainer." It's just, <laughs> well, um, and so well, this is. Um, Sort of the premise, well, one of the rationales behind one of the projects I did, which um, I, was, I was making a Twitter bot, but I wanted a Twitter bot that had everything at its disposal within Twitter itself. It, was, it, it could feed off the, the application programming interface. And I created every user. And every user lists on a tweet every single user on Twitter. It's going, starting from uh, the first person who joined Twitter, and it just continues on gradually. Um, I'm amazed it hasn't been blocked. Uh, it's, it's spammed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Like every two minutes, it spams someone new. Um, and it's managed to cover everyone that joined Twitter in 2006 that, are still, uh, that still have their accounts active. It's now, I think, some, somewhere around February 2007. So if you're on Twitter, it will eventually get to you. Uh, I, I know it uh, caught John McNeil. You had uh, every user tweet at you, right? No? Well, it'll get to you. Uh, and uh, it has a lot, a lot of positive reactions, but it's interesting that there's one reaction that crops up quite regularly. Once a week, someone just says, this is really creepy. Uh, and I'm quite fascinated by this description, creepy. Uh, maybe it is the, the, um, this, the word that we use to describe something that's familiar and yet unfamiliar. You know, it's, it's this kind of modern day and heimliness. Um, okay, third conjecture, exploiting the fabrication of fact. Um, facts have, well, in STS studies, uh, science and technology studies, love it or hate it, they, they, they look at how in science and technology, um, facts are created and, and papers are created and, and how like, you know, the scientist will have an idea, he'll test it, there'll be some results that are published, those uh, become peer reviewed, they become peer references, uh, referenced if they're popular, you know, if they kind of gain traction, then it might become public, and then eventually it might become a tacit fact, you know, like water boils at roughly around 100 degrees Celsius, it's tacit, you don't have to test it, you don't have to reference who said it in the first place. Um, and I think, I think uh, Bruno Latour, he, he kind of posits this bad question. Well, he, he, he kind of uh, teases out this question that we ask ourselves. Are scientific facts real or are they constructed? And he says this is a really problematic question because, you know, they, they're real because they are constructed, because they've gone through this, like, fabrication process. Um, but he, he kind of feels that, you know, actually, we identify things that feel like they've just always been there as being real. But if it's kind of man-made, then it's not real. It's kind of a weird conundrum. And it's, it sounds even weirder when you, you replace scientific facts for technologies. Like, it feels like obvious that they, they, they are real because, because they are fabricated. Um, and this reminded me, uh, Facebook, actually, they call a division um, of, of their engineering the trust engineers. 
and the, the trust engineers. They're, 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 they're sort of like um, the, 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 the kind of mechanical Turk in the surface. So it's, that's just there kind of like tweaking the service to improve it to make that experience a lot more better. Uh, so they're trying to do a good thing. They're, 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 you know, they're, this is actually in Tokyo. If you're ever in Tokyo, you should definitely press the help button. Uh, um, but you know, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're constantly changing uh, Facebook uh, without you realizing it. And they, they kind of got, they got um, a lot of bad press, actually. We kind of like lost trust in them, uh, even though they're called trust engineers, uh, because of one experiment where they were looking at how emotions are, are, are kind of contagious on the internet. So they were kind of algorithmically manipulating the, the sentiment of of, of your news feeds and then seeing if you'd you know, respond, if you'd become happier that day or, or kind of more depressed. Um, uh, who else engineers I trust? Uh, his, this is a really strange one. This is, um, I argue to be someone uh, manipulating rankings in an app store. So this person's job is to uh, install the same app again and again and again on a, a whole array of iPhones to, to, she's been paid, well, this company's been paid to, to boost the rankings of a particular app. Um, and so uh, some of my practice is kind of about intervening in, in this nascent stage of like trusting new technologies. Uh, this, I I'm, see I'm running out of time here, so I'm just gonna quickly go, here's one uh, technology I was interested in, well, for a long time, has been 3D printing. And 3D printing went through this like w awkward phase where people started to lose their trust in it because there was guns, uh, there was uh, online piracy, um, Pirate Bay was adding it to like one of their categories. You know, the, the so I created this, I, I kind of like had a response that was kind of tongue in cheek and, and kind of provoking a, a response again within this like this, the sense of trust in, in 3D printing. And I created this app which would let you in, encrypt uh, 3D prints. It would distort them in a way that would um, make them unrecognizable. And then you could kind of um, share that online on one of these uh, file sharing sites. In plain sight, you know, no one recognized that that could be a twisted up, uh, contorted, contentious file. And then the person receiving that could use the same app and the same key code to reverse that distortion and retrieve the original object. And it was really interesting to suddenly find yourself caught up in, in the narratives of these new technologies. You know, that, um, uh, well, here it is in Forbes, and, and, and just the language that's used, you know. Um, uh, if 3D printing companies and government agencies hope to police the spread of dangerous or pirate to digital shapes, the task is about to get much more complicated. Um, here's another project. Uh, again, looking at this nascent stage of this technology, uh, I was really interested in image classification algorithms. They're algorithms that uh, promise to be able to describe uh, what's in the image and kind of give it a caption. Uh, and you, you can understand that has a lot of uh, commercial applications in mind. Uh, it's, and it's kind of going for its research period, you know, the way it's disseminated to the public is you know, at the moment like through research papers that get picked up by the press and, you know, and the, these technologies start to get talked about. So it was kind of a really interesting way to, uh, interesting time to intervene in this, the, the, this new technology. And I created a project, um, Novice Art Blogger is an automated Tumblr um, that's uh, borrowing some images from the Tate. Uh, processing it through a uh, neural network uh, image classification algorithm that's hosted online by a, a research group and then publishes those images on Tumblr with the, the, the kind of the, the captioning created by the system as if it was an art critic. And obviously, like, because it's um, abstract art that hasn't been trained upon, it kind of uses all these kind of metaphors to describe what it's doing. Um, we kind of know what this is, but to, 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 the, to the algorithm, this could be a confetti on a table, uh, a donut with sprinkles and fireworks. Uh, this um, piece by Joseph Boyce looks like a man on skis with poles. And you can kind of see the shape there, you know what it's actually recognized. It's uh, quite interesting. It's quite endearing, actually. A lot of, a lot of the uh, feedback I get on, on Tumblr is, oh, it's so adorable. Um, and then this one is one of my favorite. The, it's just death in the conquistador, you know, it's depicting something really gruesome, but I can see its point. I think it does look like a close-up of pizza. Uh, and 
more, more specifically, a pizza decorated to look like an angry bird. So uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's got these kind of new cultural references based on like, you know, what it's been trained on as well. Um, and it's interesting, again, how that becomes then part of the discourse around these new technologies. This, ro this robot reviews art better than most critics. You know? uh, and there's like loads of like questions posed by the journalists, like, you know, a robot's going to take over our jobs and, you know. Um, and I, I guess, you know, that just ends uh, my conversation. I've kind of done a meta conversation rather than just present my work. I've also presented to you how I'm, I'm seeing how that work comes across. So thank you. <laughs>